Hello, hello, everyone. GM, GM. Welcome back to another episode of Overpriced JPEGs and your favorite recurring segment, Moment of Zeneca. Zeneca, thank you so much as always for being here. Thank you for having me as always. It's a pleasure. So we are going to do what we always do, uh, talk about the macro situation going on. There's uh, kind of a lot to go on there. We got the CPI number today and it's not the prettiest thing in the world. Um, <laughs> NFT news. There are some celebrity drops I want to talk about. Uh, Doodles, Jenkins, the ballet, new website. I mean, we're going to get into all of it. And of course, your Art Blocks love affair continues. <laughs> and it seems like the world's love affair with Art Blocks continues. So yes. I also want to end. I have some, some tweets that I thought had some hot takes I wanted to get your thoughts on. So maybe we'll end with thoughts on these tweets, a new segment within our segment I love it. <laughs> within our I recurring love it. moment of Zeneca segment. All right. But first, <laughs> as you know, we got to hear a word from our lovely, lovely sponsors. There is a brand new staking feature in the Ledger Live app today. We all like staking the assets that we're bullish on. And now you can stake seven different coins inside the Ledger Live app. Cosmos, Polkadot, Tron, Algorand, Tezos, Solana, and of course, Ethereum. With Ledger Live, you can take money from your bank account, buy your most bullish crypto asset, and stake that asset to its network, all inside the Ledger Live app. Through a partnership with Figment, Ledger also lets you choose which validator you want to stake your assets with. And Ledger is running its own validating nodes, offering a convenient way to participate in network validation, and it even comes with slashing insurance. Ledger Live is truly becoming the battle station for the bankless world, so go download Ledger Ledger Live. If you have a ledger already, you probably already have it and get started securely staking your crypto assets. CoinShift is a leading treasury management and infrastructure platform for DAOs and crypto businesses who need to manage their treasury operations. Every crypto org needs to manage their treasury, and CoinShift offers a simple, flexible, and efficient multi-chain treasury management platform built on top of the extremely secure Gnosis Safe. With CoinShift, your organization can go from primitive single-chain treasuries to expressive, flexible, multi-chain features such as global user management, global contracts, proposal management, and many other features that can be shared across an entire organization. CoinShift layers on powerful treasury management tools on top of the proven security of Gnosis Safe, allowing users to save time and reduce operational burdens and gas costs. CoinShift even has data tools like account reporting across the seven chains on which it operates. Used by industry powerhouses such as Uniswap Grants, Balancer, Consensus, and Mazari, CoinShift is speeding up the coordination and efficiency of the organizations that use it. In DeFi, you have to keep up with the frontier, and CoinShift makes that easy. So sign up at coinshift.xyz slash bankless. All right, Zeneca, let's kick off as we always do. Give us the macro landscape here. What's the outlook? How are you feeling? What's going on? Yeah, I, I can't remember the last time. Like it's been a while since we chatted and where we were in terms of the macro state then. But I'm imagining it's probably not that different. Like ETH has been around that 1 to 1.2K mark for, for ages now. Um, I mean, if we zoom out and look at you know, CPI, inflation, those numbers came out today, 9.1%. Uh, it's not great, but I mean, the crypto market at least hasn't reacted that bad, I think. I think almost like some of it was certainly priced in. People were expecting it and it's like business as usual now. So I think that's honestly the way ETH has been holding 1K is like extremely bullish to my mind. And yeah, so like that that's like the, the macro crypto and world markets in the NFT space. We're still like at this trending sideways state where volumes are low, like, you know, very low compared to say April and earlier, uh, high compared to say, you know, early last year, of course. So we're still like not in a terrible state and we're still in this free mint meta, which is interesting. I didn't think it would last this long, but we're seeing a lot of free mints continue to come out. Most of them are not doing well. Maybe they, they pop off for a day and then they fizzle off. So I think that it's, it's high risk as is with most things in this space. Um, and then on the other side, we're seeing like blue chips kind of perform decently well, um, bought apes like back up to 100 ETH. Moonbirds ran up. I think they're like 26, 27, 28. They hit like 40 for like a minute because there were a couple of big sweeps. Uh, Doodles is holding pretty strong. And then Art Blocks Generative Art is really like, I know I talk about it a lot because I'm obsessed, but it's like you can tell like looking at metrics, it's having a significant movement. Prices are like going up across the board. A lot more new eyes on it. Um, which is great. It's fun, but it's also like where things get frothy and dangerous. And like, if you're trying to FOMO in now, um, just like, just don't FOMO, like <laughs> take the time, do your research. This is something that's going to be around for decades, centuries. So it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint on that front. Um, yeah, macro, I think it's, it's still, if to sum it up in a sentence, business as usual. Are you 
feeling bullish? Like, do you think there'll be much change over the next, let's call it 12 months? Or do you think we'll continue along this trend of blue chips doing well? Uh, or do you think there's more pain to come on the NFT market side? Yeah, I mean, it's a million dollar question. I obviously don't know. No one knows. I think I would say over the, like, the shorter term, the next few months, uh, I don't really expect any significant or massive changes. I'd be surprised if like prices just all of a sudden start truly rocketing up across the board. We're always going to see like certain projects perform well. Uh, 12 months is a lifetime in this space. Uh, I'm just going to say I have no idea. Like uh, honest, <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. I, I think I'm feeling nervous. I, I've said this before on the pod. I just, I've been impressed by how well, NFTs have held up. And actually, I think mm. Eric Connor said, uh, had a had a tweet that said something very similar where he was basically like, it's impressive to me. It's pretty remarkable how well NFTs have held up in ETH, in ETH terms during mm. the bear. They have clearly outperformed nearly every token. I think people feel more attached and a real sense of community with their NFTs. So the panic selling isn't rampant or isn't as mm -hmm. rampant, which uh, I think is clearly true. I, I've been pretty impressed by how well NFTs have held up as well. Um, but I, I think this, Eric, sort of talking about this, it may be premature. I think there may be more pain to come. I don't know. I, I'm tracking this conversation around, are we in a credit bubble and will there be a credit mm. collapse? And and have consumers really been hit as hard as they will be at a certain point? I think some of this, some of the problems we're experiencing right now are on the supply side. And obviously the Fed is doing everything they can to try and crush demand, but I don't think they've like fully necessarily mm. done so yet. And And if they do, how will that then impact the NFT market and will we see more sell-offs? So I, I'm I'm still a little nervous that there mm. there might be more pain to come. Yeah, no, I, it's hard to disagree with that. Uh, at the end of the day, like NFTs exist in the the scope of the the macro environment, and at the end of the day, if people need money for food on the table it, or like you know living expenses, basics. If there's more fear, people start to really clamp down and hold on to what they have, and there's like a flock to stable coins fiat eth even but um not necessarily jpegs although like like eric said um you know the, we are seeing these communities rally behind it and i think it's such an interesting psychological dynamic where it's it's like we're all in this together and if we just collectively as a community decide <laughs> it gets into like what's the value of these things but if the community decides hey we value it bought apes at 100 eth we're not going to sell lower than that that's the full price if somehow you got ten thousand people to agree mm -hmm to a thousand ETH floor price, that's quote unquote the floor price. It's not the value because you need buyers. And that's, I think, a mistake a lot of people make. They conflate floor price with value. But um, if there's, as long as there's liquidity, which the current, like there's several sales a day, I don't know, five, 10 um, for board apes. It's, yeah, it's, it's just interesting experiments. So yeah, I don't know. I guess we'll see. This will this will lead us well into a project I want to talk about with it, which is the Wizards project. But I, I will say it was funny. I was um, tracking the CPI release this morning a bit, it came out at like 8.30 a.m. ET. And it's hilarious if you look at like the 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 ETH, the ETH chart, you yeah. know, it's like, it, it like you know, like 8.25, it's one thing. And then at 8.35, it just drops down by like 30 yeah. bucks. But it, it wasn't a crazy, it wasn't a crazy dip. And then it, it yeah. started to rally back up. So I agree. I think it, it seems like people maybe were pricing in that the CPI number was going to be bad and it's not, or, or people maybe are, are yeah. feeling like it's lagging and that prices will be a bit better in August. And so, um, so we'll see, but let's 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 go into Wizards. Have you been tracking this this project at all? It, it was also one of these free mint CCOs, I think. A little bit, yeah, yeah. I think so. I think it came out um, what like a few weeks after Goblins. Yeah, and has a similar vibe in some ways to Goblins. Uh, you know, it's it's W Z R D S, um, and yeah, it feels like it has a Goblins vibe and is clearly trying to trying to ride that trend but they did something really interesting recently did you did you see what they did yeah where uh holders could burn if you if you had your token staked or something you could burn other people's tokens if they had listed it for sale something like that that's right so basically they you can stake your wizard if you stake your wizard you earn shrooms and then you could use shrooms to burn any wizards that they called cowzards. Like it's like W Z R D S, and then they call them cow, you know, cow wizards, like cowards, cowards, like yeah. C O W Z R D S. Any, any, um, 
wizards that were listed, I think for under 3.2 ETH. I think mm. you can't burn them if they're above that. But if they're listed for under 3.2 ETH, you could then burn them. And um, they had like a thousand wizards tokens get burned. And so, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then, you know, there were only like 67 listed left. Yeah. Yeah. So I first saw what the, the, I first saw that, just the fact that they did that. And I was like, this is interesting. I don't know that it's like, replicable particularly or meaningful particularly, Mm -hmm. but it got my attention because it's conceptually, I I just find it fun conceptually and I like fun conceptual things in this space. Um, I then started to track some of the controversy and was like, oh, wow, this is maybe bad. Yeah. Kind of a horrible practice, which we can, we can maybe talk about. Did you have an initial reaction? Yeah. uh, Pretty similar to yours. I was like, this is, I hadn't seen this before. I was like, oh, that's cool that you can do this with smart contracts. Interesting mechanic. And then uh, I felt a little bit, I guess, like just sad for certain people who had theirs listed and they were burned because they weren't tracking the Twitter. They weren't in the Discord checking. And and there's that whole element. Um, and then it's sort of, it, it it is basically, it reeks of like market manipulation, price manipulation. They're like, all right, we're going to just establish a floor price as this and, and introduce, introduce mechanics to sort of make it like that. It's not something I think we're going to see more of and it's not something that I want to like encourage or think is great, but it's certainly interesting and maybe there are other use cases. Um, like within, like for a gaming project, imagine like being able to burn other people, like two 10K collections and then you just burn each other's collection until there's, yeah, like that to me, someone who someone listening to this, some smart dev, go make this project. <laughs> uh, it sounds so fun. Like two 10K projects fighting, yeah. So I think that's a great point. I've been tracking this a little bit. Gosh, I'm going to forget his name. There's a guy, he actually went on G Money's podcast. There's a, a there's a game dev, I, I believe he's a game dev, he's a dev certainly, who's working on like these fight to the death style games um, where, you know, if you enter the arena, you actually risk losing mm. your NFT. And he was sort of flagging that as like a, a good use of like scarcity and blockchain technology. I think there's a lot of times where we impose artificial scarcity Mm. in this world. So we have these games where we have an artificial amount of land or a super, you know, Mm -hmm. artificially scarce land. Like in theory, there's no reason the sandbox can't have infinite land. And increasingly I, I, you know, I've spoken a lot and and sort of, I'm not a huge fan of the scarce land plot model um, for practical reasons, but also it it feels skeuomorphic. It's like, why are we Mm. imposing web to like, not just web two, but like physical world rules mm-hmm. in a digital world. Why don't we create things that take advantage of the inherent uniqueness of an, of a digital mm-hmm. world? So that's what this game dev was, was really getting at. Like that was his initial theory. And he's like, okay, well, these NFTs, um, can be burned and, and destroyed and in, in battle. Mm-hmm. And like that can create this sense of adrenaline and that's native to, to the a digital economy. I know a couple others actually who have, who have talked about that, um, in some interesting capacities of like upping the ante for media and content. Like what if you were watching a show on TV and you had NFTs that were a part of that? If you're watching Game of Thrones and you had certain Game of Thrones yeah. NFTs and they would get burned if based on something that happens in the show. And when I think about what an adrenaline junkie culture we are <laughs> and how like our shows have gotten more violent or more sexual or mm-hmm. more whatever, like we keep having to raise the bar to keep our attention spans. This feels like a really interesting next domain in that yeah. to me of like, you know, we want a sports bet because we want the, we want higher stakes. And it's like, how can we get higher stakes now in our TV and movies? So a a tangent there based on what you just said, I think that's, I think you're spot on that. That's a really cool idea of like battle games where you actually, um, winners and losers, like get their NFTs burned or stolen or or something along those lines. We saw a little bit of it, I think with Wolf game and like all the copycats after that, where I think, you know, Wolf would kill a sheep, but I think it was like, you weren't actively burning other people's tokens based on your actions. It was if you were like claiming your wool, I think if I'm remembering correctly, if you're a sheep holder and you claim your wool, there's like a percentage chance that one of your sheep will get burned and, and eaten. And I think that yes. yeah, just more of like innovation on that front, like say what you want about Wolf Game. I think it was really interesting and it still is like, you know, there's a really strong community around it. So that's, yeah, I'm excited for the future basically as always. The innovation to me will be when it's more based on skill rather than mm. luck. Like Wolf Game was was a, a chance game. And when, like what I loved about what you put forth there was more like maybe there's a way for it. It has to do with skill and you're actually playing or you're battling or you're doing something that where then the best player based on XYZ skill sets 
wins and the others gets burned as opposed to just these kind of like lottery yeah. mechanisms, which are fun and kind of thrilling as well. But um, I'll, I'll just flag before we move on from this, the the one of the tweets from a, a wizard community member who was disgruntled about this said, had my wizard burned by the community just for having it listed. So great to have an NFT I paid 0.37 ETH for burned without my authorization just because I don't follow the tweets. <laughs> he was a little disgruntled, really great community project, fuck this. And then he said, Def- definitely didn't intend for this tweet to blow up, but I guess it's a good debate around whether this meta is a good thing. Mm. I, In general, I wouldn't have had as much of a problem with it if there was a more clear, clear like warning to anyone buying ahead of time that this would happen. Yeah. And then funny to all the people who are saying they should have paid more attention, like it was only tweeted two hours ahead of time. So I, I'm really sympathetic to that. Um, and, 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 and the other thing is the it now has a 3.2 ETH floor, you know, because nobody yeah. will list below in case they get burned. But it doesn't actually mean anything because if you look at the sales, it's like 0.31. Yeah. It's people making bids in ETH on mm-hmm. Wizards and then people being willing to sell them yeah. to the bidder for 0.3 or, or 1 ETH or whatever. So yeah. we've sort of um, lost like a natural market. Yeah, it's very weird. Uh, you know, we, we don't necessarily know what the what the natural price is of these. So I, I don't necessarily feel long-term bullish, but I think it's it was an interesting... Uh, Interesting thought experiment. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we have new celebrities coming into the space. Have you been tracking the the celebrity entrance mm, a, at all? Not so much. I've like heard about them on like my periphery, but I haven't really been paying attention. Have you? Maybe you can catch me up. A, a little bit. I mean, truthfully, I, uh, I I'm almost finding it more interesting now simply because I, I find it interesting to have these celebrities entering in a bear market. You know, yep. and then maybe it. it endears me to them a little bit yeah. more though it hasn't been going particularly well you had um sia did her souls drop which i think is is arguably the most exciting of any of them because it, it feels like sia actually maybe of the celebrities that have come in like most genuinely appreciates the space she's been in since like december like this feels like it's been many months in the making um and her project did all right they they they've got at least last I checked, like 2.3 thousand sold, which isn't terrible by any means. And um, they're doing like the, her souls community will have apparently input in creating like new music with her. And and it's, it, it feels like they're making a, a genuine effort there. So, um, and then, and then you have uh, Kevin Hart and Chris Brown. Kevin Hart, similarly, I, I'm intrigued by, mm. I think maybe he's launched in a bear market. I think he maybe is coming at this genuinely. His discord is pretty active and and um, the posts at least give lip service to them kind of getting the space. So um, that one came out this past week and I think they've, they've sold like 2.1 thousand out of, I think 5,000 mm. is their total supply. Um, and what's cool about that drop, they're doing it through Moonwalk, I think is their, is, mm-hmm. is like their partner on it. And um, you can you can buy with a credit card. So it's like 0.055 oh, nice. ETH, about 65 bucks. And they're doing the credit card thing, which I think is great. I think they're yeah. really trying to make an effort to actually draw in Chris Brown fans. Um, I don't know how, or I'm sorry, Kevin draw Hart. in Kevin Hart yeah. fans from outside the space. Um, Chris Brown is, is the final celebrity who's entered and that's gone pretty atrociously. Yeah. I think at one point, last I checked, it was like 300 had sold out of, I think it was like a 10,000 drop. Yeah. Um, but they priced them at 450 bucks, which oh, is just, expensive it was like 0.35 ETH, yeah. which is expensive um, for a project that I think it's, and again, kind of giving lip service to, you know, it's like a fan club, but I, it was a little vague what exactly you're getting for it. And so for 450 bucks, yeah. I think, uh, I think that's where they they probably went wrong. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I I agree with what you said at the beginning. It's really interesting seeing them drop in the in, in a bear market, and it doesn't surprise me that they haven't like done astoundingly well. Um, but it's nice to hear that I've heard like some chatter around the souls drop from Sierra, and people are talking about it. And there's definitely definitely interest there. And um, yeah, good luck to them. I think. Yeah. I think the order of interest to me is definitely Sia, Kevin, yeah. uh, Hart, and then and then Chris Brown. And I think that's reflected in sort of the numbers they've done. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I'm not somebody who has tracked the celebrity drops closely throughout this whole space, but I was like, oh, you're dropping in like kind of a really bad market. Does that does that speak to maybe you have really genuinely long-term aspirations here? And, and I'll give you credit for that. So even Chris Brown, I'll give yeah. him credit because unless he was just unaware of what was going on, which I doubt is the case, I think... Um, you know, he might be here for the long haul if he's dropping it now. Yeah. Okay, the new Jenkins the Valet, or Jenkins the Valet dropped a new website, and 
And has an airdrop coming? You want to catch me up on this? I think you're better versed in it than I am. Yes. Um, so they dropped a new website for Azabala, which is like their world, like the world that their story is being told in. And I think there's going to be like PFP characters and it's... It's really an excellent website. So I recommend everyone, um, maybe you can find the link, put in the show notes, goes checks it out because it's like there's sound and it's like an interactive experience. It really, it, true to their style, they take you into this this world and it's very rich in storytelling and lore. And so that was like, I think two weeks ago, three weeks ago, maybe they dropped the site. And then sometime over the last week, they had, I don't think it was an airdrop per se, but basically they released the, um, some NFTs for their book, um, which they had been working on for, you know, I think a year. Um, Bored and Dangerous is the name of the book. It's uh, authored by Neil Strauss. He's written tons and tons of books. And uh, it, it was where they had, I think it was in December, they had um, this like open call for the community who wanted to, who held a Jenkins token to license their ape to be featured in the book in some capacity. Um, or to receive royalties in the revenue. of I, I don't know 100% how it worked with the licensing agreement, but this is like the culmination of everything that they've been working towards. Like since day one, they were like, hey, well, let's write a book around this character, Jenkins of LA, get community involvement. And now um, they release those as NFT tokens. I'm actually not sure what the relationship is between the token and, and the physical book. Is there an NFT book? I think that there's some burn mechanic where I think you can burn one or maybe two of the tokens into a a DAO token. And and there's re like really interesting tokenomics at play. And it's performed fairly well. So I believe it was a Dutch auction. I don't know what it started at, like maybe one ETH or maybe 0 0.8. And then it dropped to 0.2, I think was the resting price, maybe 0.15. Um, and I believe it sold out. And for a while it trended on secondary. It was, I think, 0.3 floor. Now we're, I think, pretty close to mint. But there's different rarities and different um, types of books. I think different titles or subtitles have different value. Um, and I think the airdrop component, or like the maybe there's an airdrop coming up. And excuse my ignorance because it's yeah, it's it's a little complicated. But there was definitely a um, if you held a Jenkins token, you could mint at like an allow list guaranteed mint at 0.15. So I think like the the, the resting floor might have been 0.2. And then I think there's an additional airdrop of like a few thousand tokens that has either just happened or is coming up soon um, for some subset of the community. And yeah, it, it gained some buzz. And like in this market, anything that sells out, I think is impressive. Um, although I did have a conversation earlier today, actually, where I shouted to someone about how, you know, go back six months, four months, Jenkins of Valet did a follow up. Um, anything, it would have like been a gas war or like Dutch auction at max, like point A would have gone, they would have flew out the window. Whereas this one went to resting price and like secondary isn't, and I think that's just a, like a statement on where we are in the market. Um, and if anything, it's it's certainly a testament to like Jenkins, everything they've built and the goodwill and the community that, you know, they did release more NFTs and they're performing relatively well. Yeah. So, uh, you know, t I know Jenkins is is a Tally Labs project, and we've talked about Tally in the past. They they closed a, a pretty big fundraising round, I think, not in the too distant past that we talked about on the show, maybe a couple months back. Mm -hmm. But Jenkins, the valet, so he's the he's the board ape character, and you've actually interviewed Jenkins previously. Mm -hmm. um, and then they've built a whole community around him where they have Jenkins NFTs that had come out. Is that is that right? Again, I'm embarrassed that I don't know this, but uh, and now they're um, adding yeah. to that community. Is that how it is? Yeah, basically. So when I chatted to him, I think it was like, I don't know, God, time flies. Maybe like eight months, no, six months ago. So it would have been just after the- Six um, months ago when you interviewed Jenkins? I think so. Maybe longer. It's time, time. this is, year has gone- means nothing. It, like last year felt like a century and then this year is just flying by um i'm actually going to try and find when i did interview him but oh here we go hang on while well, i got it um five months ago five months ago the video was released i probably chatted to him six months ago yeah it's crazy wow. um but anyway so he was telling me about like their plans with pfp with a dow and that kind of stuff so this bored and dangerous book nft basically um 
basically, uh, I just looked it up. You can either burn it for an Azure, Azure root, which is a sacred item within Azure Bala that can be redeemed for a PFP. So that's one option. Or you can stake it for membership in Hawthorne, which is a DAO dedicated to reimagining collective creativity. So, which is exactly what he said that their plans were six months back. He was like, we're going to, you know, there's a DAO element. We want to incorporate the community in a significant way. There's a PFP element. We want to build on the storytelling and, and get that emotional world building lore um, involvement and and this is their uh, I, I would say that their next significant step in that direction since their initial initial mint. Do you own any of these tokens? Yeah, they, they're creating a massive. Universe. I do. I, I I think I have like ten, or ten or twelve of the original Jenkins tickets, and then I I, I minted the um the Bored and Dangerous book. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do with them yet. Probably like half and half is my assumption. Yeah. Uh, speaking of burning things, we have the Damien Hurst currency burn this week. Was it this week or last week? Ongoing? Uh, it's it's ongoing. The The deadline is coming up really soon. I don't know the specific date, but it, it's like, I think, towards the end of July. So the quick highlight here for anybody who didn't know, Damien Hurst, quite famous contemporary artist, British, right? Damien yes, Hurst is British? Yes, yes. And um, he had created this piece called The Currency. You've probably seen it's a lot of dots. And uh, he issued them as NFTs, always with the premise that at a certain date, which is is at the year mark, I think, you know, this, yep. this time this year, you could choose to take your currency and burn it, burn the NFT in exchange for a physical Damien Hurst currency print. Mm -hmm. um, or you could keep the NFT. So it's a commentary on like digital versus physical art. I'm going to go out on a limb, Zeneca, and say you have some currencies and are <laughs> in the process or have already decided what you're going to be doing with them. Is that yeah, fair? That is fair. Um, I have two. I, I, I got one at oh, Mint shocking. a year ago. <laughs> and the intention was basically always, I was like, well, the, the thing to do is, right, you get, if you can, get two, burn one for the physical, keep one as an NFT. Um, and I guess I like left it kind of late. Like, I think this was a fairly obvious play. You could have seen this coming that as we got closer to burn, floor price would go up because more people would be like, well, I can't decide. I want to. And just general, there'll be more media attention on like there is right now. We're talking about it because it's an event coming up. More people become aware of the project. Um, so my plan is to burn one, keep one. I've seen some like videos and images of the physicals and they look, I mean, they're small. They're like a postcard size, but they look really I mean, the texture is cool. The colors are vibrant and like owning a physical Damien Hurst, like he is one of the greats in terms of art, art history, his contribution. Like he certainly can be controversial, but you know, owning a physical Damien Hurst, that is not something that many people will ever realistically be able to say. So I think that's cool. I think the entire project is a really great experiment. Um, and I listened to some interviews when he launched it last year and it was clear that he got it. Like he, this was not a cash grab. This was, for starters, he doesn't need money. For second, $2,000 was the mint price. It was priced in fiat. Is actually not that expensive at all for a Damien Hurst, even if there's 10,000 of them. Um, and, and just listening to him talk, he was like really fascinated by the outcome of it. And I think he, th his prediction, at least back then, was that more people would want to burn the NFT and redeem the physical. Cause he's like, well, clearly there's more value in a, a piece of a physical piece of my work than a digital image. Um, but he did acknowledge that there's a possibility that the NFTs would win and he'd be fascinated by it. And it might make him rethink his worldview or his everything. And it, it very just deep thinking went into it. It, it wasn't uh, just a real cash grab. People on the surface, look at it. The art is just a bunch of colored dots and they all look, very, very similar. So like that is that you can't dispute that. You get ten of them, in, and you probably can't tell the difference without really, really digging into them. Um, the naming is interesting. He's always had like his his names for his traditional contemporary artworks are like really elaborate. Um, and for this, I think they, there's an AI element for for choosing the names, and and they're pretty cool. Uh, and yeah, it's just a really interesting project i looked up that the burn date is it's coming up in 13 days and 20 hours from now so i believe that's the 27th of july um do you know how many have been burned last i 
last I heard it was like 17% had been burned. Yeah. Do you so, know what the burn rate is right uh, now? I was- yeah. So there's 10K total at this point, um, 2,100. 2,132 have been burned for the physicals. So 21, 22% 22%, have been burned. So there's still almost 8,000 NFTs. Um, Clock is ticking, obviously. I, yeah, I I need to burn one. I I did sort of see some people who had like serious shipping issues. They were like, they had to talk to customs and and like go back and forth and and in order to get it. So like that like gave me a little bit of pause, but I, I, I still really want to, yeah, figure out how to how to get a, a physical and buy one keep one and i mean the floor is around is 8.25 eth now it's basically just been trending upwards for the last i don't know three months um it, it certainly had a big lull dip um end of last year started this year and then as to be expected as we get closer to this it's been trending upwards from i think it, it dipped to like the three-ish range three to four for several months um and it, it's also an interesting project because I think a lot of people will price it in fiat. So as the ETH price drops, um, they might be more comfortable saying, again, like the original mint was priced in fiat as 2000 US dollars equivalent. So people might be saying, well, I, I'm happy paying 10K for a physical Damien Hurst or I'm paying happy paying 5K for a Hurst. And so it just readjusted in, in uh, ETH terms as ETH dropped, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's funny to hear you say that Damien's expectations were that more people would burn it, which of course makes sense because if you've spent your entire life as a physical artist yeah. for whom people want it, will pay a lot of money to get your art, you're like, you understand the value of that, but you're you're speaking primarily to a community that's very invested in the digital. So like for me, I'm like, if I only had one, I think I would keep the digital because A, I don't trust myself with physical art. I mm-hmm. feel like especially hearing you describe the size of it, I'm like, oh, you know, I'm losing that thing in a move at some point or damaging it or yeah. <laughs> in some other way. Yeah. Um, which again speaks to why I'm quite bullish on on digital art because I just like the uh the safeness of it. I mean scams in the space mm. aside, uh, you know, put it on a ledger and I and I feel like yeah more comfortable with that than I do um than I do having a physical. Uh, but I I'll be so I, I'm I'm honestly quite excited to see where this shakes yeah. out because it, it is a really cool experiment that I think we'll have some insights to be drawn. Absolutely. It's also really interesting um, because it's not just necessarily personal preference in terms of like, do you want the physical, do you want the NFT? It's also scarcity and value. Like if if everyone decides, if like 9,000 people say, hey, I want the physical and burn and there's only 1,000 NFTs then the NFT becomes so much more rare. So if I had to guess, I would say we would get to like pretty close to the 50-50 mark. And I think... Yeah, I don't know which side. Like in my mind, I think more people will probably want to burn, um, and, and maybe sixty percent burn, forty percent um, keep the NFT. Um, but the other part is like, yeah, like a lot of people who have two will halt burn one and 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 keep one, so that gets us closer to fifty Hold fifty on. as well. Um, honestly, yeah, well, and you're right, and people are probably waiting to yeah. to burn because they're waiting to see where things shake out, so they yep. know which one is scarcer. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, like it makes very little sense to make a decision until like the day of, un- unless you 100% know what you want to do or you're worried that you might forget, which is where I'm, <laughs> where I put myself in that category. Um, uh, I was going to say one last thing, but it has, oh yeah, no, that, that was it. Like, I think there's some subset of people who've literally just forgotten, like they, they didn't mark their calendar that the, the burn date is 27th of July. They, they maybe minted or they bought it eight months ago, a year ago. And they were like, and maybe they've just like the bear market's hit and they're like, well, I'm not going to bother checking in on my NFT and crypto portfolio. And and so I, I don't know what the percentage, but, but I think that because of that, maybe we, we end up with fewer burned. Yeah. 60, final answer, 60, 40. Strategically. 60% held NFTs. 60, 40. 40% burned. And 40% burned for, for physicals. Mm. I like that bet. I'll, 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 uh. I'll take the, oh gosh, we're already at 22%. So I'll take, <laughs> I would actually probably go the same. I'd probably, yeah. but, but for the sake of um, we doing a bet here, I'll take the over in terms of it being closer to okay. 50, 50. I'll take, we'll no, I'll in, take in the, I'll take it closer to being like more than 40%. I'll say like 50% mm-hmm. burn, 50% keep as NFT. Okay. Um, right. So I, it, it's also a bet in my opinion on where you think the future of art will land mm. uh, could, could could factor into the calculation, right? Like the, the 
thing that I find so interesting is to the extent, I think art is in part a store of value in today's Mm -hmm. market and world. Art is in part um, just aesthetic. You like the way something looks in your home, maybe. And then it's part social signaling. And the social signaling piece of this, I think, is increasingly going to be more powerful online because you're going to Mm -hmm. reach so many more people. You already reach so many more people with your digital presence than you do in your home. Like the number of people who have come to my apartment is microscopic compared to the number (laughs) of people who, um, you know, see my Instagram. So Mm -hmm. that's part of the reason I'm bullish on digital art is I just think to the extent that any of this is, is social signaling or just showing who you are and your tastes, digital art should become more valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I I totally agree. MetaMask is the leading Web3 wallet to get you access to everything you need in Web3. If you're just getting started on your NFT journey, you need MetaMask. And if you need to fund your MetaMask account in order to buy that NFT that you've been eyeing, well, now you can do that directly through MetaMask. Just click the blue buy button on the home screen. Personally, I'm mad that I've spent extra gas fees transferring money from Coinbase to MetaMask in order to buy NFTs. I've been using MetaMask directly and it is so much better. You can also buy stable coins and native tokens from Ethereum, Poly, Gone, Avalanche, CeeLo, and others. And you can do it directly with your debit card, your credit card, through Apple Pay or Google Pay. And there is now an improved buying experience on MetaMask Mobile. You'll only see tokens that are in your region, so it's personalized to you. And you'll get real-time quotes, so you know you're always getting the best deal. If you haven't downloaded MetaMask yet, what are you waiting for? Go try it out. You can learn more about buying cryptocurrencies with MetaMask at metamask.io slash buy dash crypto. Immutable X is the layer two platform for crypto gaming. Immutable offers massive scalability with up to 9,000 transactions per second and instant transaction confirmation. No more gas fees, no more waiting around for your transaction to clear. Immutable's zero knowledge rollup finally unlocks the world of crypto gaming. Immutable X is the only gas free NFT minting platform with over 26 million NFTs minted all with zero gas fees. With the power of Immutable, gaming developers don't also need to become smart contract developers. They just need to plug in to Immutable's API and instantly start unlocking the full potential of crypto assets inside of games. This is why world-class companies and projects have decided to deploy on Immutable X like GameStop, Ember Sword, Planet Quest, Alluvium, TikTok, and many more behind the scenes. So start building your game on Immutable X today at immutable.com. Let's talk about some of the blue chip activity that's happening. We have Doodles uh, and the bucket auction that went off. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm going to let you walk me through this a little bit. I I have to say, I'm... I'm having a harder time than usual tracking the whole Doodles ecosystem. I, I have talked quite a bit about their maybe decision to to move on to Flow. I have thoughts on that, and I think they're I, I I like their premise of we need to get millions of people into our ecosystem, and that that's really how you you win in this space. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's how you win from a price perspective, to be honest, but I think that's how you win in terms of creating long lasting IP. Um, so talk to me about this Doodles bucket auction. I know they were auctioning off wearables and, and maybe how that plays into the, the broader ecosystem here, as far as we know. Yeah. So as you said, they've basically come out and said that their plan is to grow the ecosystem, the Doodles brand ecosystem by like millions and release millions of NFTs. And I think that that's great. It's great for adoption. It's great for the brand. It's probably not great for like short-term price appreciation or value for like until there's clarity about how the value goes back to the existing holders and, and of the NFTs they release. Um, but I, generally speaking, I think it's the right, right approach, especially for a brand like Doodles that really wants to take on the world, partner with Pharrell and, and go to music and all sorts of interesting IP plays. So their bucket auction, that was, again, time is weird, but like maybe a couple of weeks ago, um, which is basically they were selling these uh, Doodles boxes. Like I think they're called Genesis boxes. Um, and, and I believe the the unboxing or like what's in the box is meant to be like wearables for your Doodle. That you can interchange and you can like wear, you get dress your Doodle up. You can trade these NFTs. You can swap them around. Um, I'm not sure like the specifics and logistics of, you know, is there one wearable per box? Is it a collection of wearables? How that all works out? I'm not on top of that. And this was something that they actually launched um, in NFT NYC. So part of their physical event and activation was they had like these massive machines that, you know, people who were there that could go up to, I think that you had to pay, um, in my mind, $123 is, is a number that's just floating around for that. Um, but you know, you got one of these NFTs and I believe that they allocated 4,000 for that. And then they said, we're going to do a bucket auction release, um, 20,000 additional um, of these boxes. And the way it worked was, I think that they, um, started the auction 
and, and, and they ran it for like three days and you could go to their website and make a bid and basically saying how much you want to pay. And uh, you, you could bid any amount. You could bid 0.1 ETH. You could bid 500 ETH. And they would take all of the, the bids and look at, I think, roughly what the average price is. Or I can't remember the exact mechanics of the algorithm that they used. But they, uh, I, I believe that the way that they worded it in explaining it was like, at the end of the auction, we will have all of these bids and all this information and the, all this pricing. And we'll be able to find like, quote unquote, the fair market value and allocate based on how much people pay. So let's say you put 100 ETH in, I think Pranksy, Jimmy, I think Steve Aoki, <laughs> for whatever you want to say about that, added a whole bunch. And like, let's say we decide the fair market price is 0.5, put 100 ETH in, that gets you 2,000. Is that what I'm thinking? Put 200 um, NFTs. Whereas if you put in 0.6 ETH into the auction, well, then you'll get one box and we'll refund you 0.1. And the end result, to my mind, so it basically it settled at the 0.5 mark. Um, and you could see where it was in real time and it sort of trended upwards as more people put more money in. There was more money in the bucket. So obviously the price is going to go up. People were bidding higher and higher. Um, and it was just a really interesting experiment. So I, I really appreciate that they did it and tried it. And I think they genuinely found like, pretty close to fair market value um, because if you track secondary market for like several days afterwards, it basically floated around the exact same price as mint 0.5. Um, I believe now it's down um, maybe at like 0 0.35, 0 0.4 um, is, I'm trying to look it up, um, is, is where it's at. And I think that's not necessarily an indication um, 0.37. Uh, I, I don't think that's necessarily an indication that the pricing was off per se, but more of like in a statement on liquidity where like people said, well, I'm happy to, to I, I, I'll pay 0.5 or whatever, but then we're all juggling liquidity in this space. And, and it's like, well, now what? I want to go mint something else. I'm going to sell this. And, and it's not doing it. Like so people have short turn, short attention spans. And despite the mechanics of the auction, certainly there was some percentage of people who were like, I'm going to mint and then flip it for 3x or, or try and flip it, which is, I think if you understood how the auction worked, unlikely to happen, but um, a really interesting experiment nonetheless and a good way to expand the ecosystem. Again, like the Doodles floor price was like, I don't know, probably between 12 and 16 ETH, which is it's been hovering at. Um, so in order to like expand their ecosystem and have a price point that's accessible for new members who are like maybe wanting to be part of the doodles ecosystem. This was a really good entry point. It still is 0.37 um, in a way that doesn't dilute the original either. It's like very distinct. It's not more PFPs. It's not just another 10 K collection. It's something separate. Um, and it, it, it does get a bit confusing all the moving parts and um, how they, the auction worked and, where they're going with it all. Like you alluded, they might be going to the flow network. I think that they've said that they're exploring other blockchains and especially if they're thinking millions and millions of people and onboarding quote unquote, the masses or the normies, it makes sense that they look for options that are credit card friendly, low gas, cheaper and stuff like that. Um, whether that's flow, whether that's a layer two on ETH or something else, uh, I don't think it's a hundred percent been decided, but uh, I have been hearing a lot of chatter about flow, but it might just be people, I've heard like criticism or like people being like hoping that they don't go to flow. Um, yeah, that that's like, that's my summary of it all. I love it. Okay. My thoughts. I agree. I, I, I find this bucket auction model really interesting. You and I actually spoke about it months back, uh, roughly this concept, because it was something Kai Turner, who is on the pod today, we're recording this on Wednesday, July 13th. Um, uh, he had floated this idea to me many months ago as something he was talk he was interested in. And he he's quite friendly with with Jordan Castro Poopy of the Doodles team. So I wouldn't be surprised if they had maybe talked about it as, you know, Kai has talked about liking this blind auction model and and it avoids that scenario in like a Dutch auction where like at the last minute everybody sees what it's gonna go for and then you have a gas war and it's you know, difficult if you're new trying to get in. So um very cool, of course, Doodles. It, it just it amazes me how frequently I think they handle things really well and how few missteps I feel like they make. The flow thing, interestingly, somebody had put out a tweet thread that I discussed and I think linked to 
in last week or, or the episode two weeks ago that folks can find, who stated quite definitively that they were moving to Flow, which is where some of my confusion came in. And he seemed to, like, he, he made some comment of, like, my friend, my friend Jordan or my friend, you know, acting like he had inside inf- info, which which may be totally untrue. It may have been Degentraland, actually, uh, who, who tweeted about it. Um, so that had led me to think that it was definitive, though I had also heard Jordan say, I think on a Twitter space, that he would prefer to settle on Ethereum and, and have that be the settlement layer, which of course would imply like an L2. So I agree. Until I hear something definitive out of the Doodles team, I, I won't assume anything is locked. I would like to see them on an L2. I've talked about that previously. I think, um, you know, I, I think you don't want to like bifurcate your your collection and and kind of lose the liquidity and the the interoperability. It's it's not so easy. It's not it's kind of not easy getting anything off of flow from what I understand. Um, and so let alone kind of transitioning from flow to, to Ethereum. And so I would love to see them on an L2, but, um, but as always, I kind of feel like I trust they'll end up making a smart choice because we've just seen so many smart choices come out of this team. Um, so cool. All right. Well, I'm, I'm glad to be more up to date on that. Let me ask, what did this have to do with the duplicator? And was the duplicator the machine from which you could buy the Genesis box in, in person at NFT NYC? It's a really good question. I, I don't know what the interplay with the duplicator is. I know that they like revealed the, the duplicator and like basically it's just a bunch of different rarities. Like they, they just said that uh you have a very common a common or a rare duplicator and that's kind of all we know in that respect so yeah i i heard some funny criticism about how people were like do they really just call it very common because most people get there like oh great i have a very common that's that's great thanks doodles (laughs) well i had a bet going when they first announced it because it was back in Oh, I was at permission list. So it would have been in May, I guess, that they announced the duplicator. And my my hypothesis was that this was going to be something where you as a doodles holder could put, could like wrap your doodle or, or like almost create um, like a second NFT off of your doodle that could then be sold and from which you would derive royalties as a way for them to expand their base of doodle holders while continuing to, 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 um, reward their original holders. Sort of like the licensing models we're seeing playing out where it's almost like you're licensing your character to be remade as a future character for future players. So it's not a security because, you know, you're you're getting paid basically for that licensing. Um, and and I think that's A, a really interesting concept. B, it's something that, do, that Jordan had sort of hinted at when he was on the show months ago. And B, the name Duplicator felt like it lent itself to that. Um, so I, I guess it's uh, somebody can tweet at me and tell me if we already have the answer to, to exactly what that is. But that had been my bet as to what that was going to do. Yeah. No, I think that makes a ton of sense. And I think we'll probably see something like that. Yeah. I look forward to it. Okay. Uh, Yuga has stress tested the other side metaverse. We know that in just a few days, by the time this comes out, it'll be to tomorrow, I believe. So this will come out on Friday. I believe it's Saturday, July 16th, that they are going to be doing this, this some beta testing with the community for the other side game and mm-hmm. metaverse. I am with bated breath waiting <laughs> to get more info on this yeah. because I've been a little critical of this. I don't, I don't think that I have uh, sort of, it's the opposite of the, my feeling with doodles, which is, I think that Yuga is obviously a very talented team, but I don't think I've seen the same level of just like innovation. And mm-hmm. I feel like they've locked into things and haven't necessarily been as like thoughtful about driving things. So I didn't love, obviously the other side execution was, was a little bit botched, but mm-hmm. on top of that, I don't love that they did a land sale in the first place. So I am, um, I'm really waiting to see what we're going to learn about this game on Saturday, because that'll help to inform how I feel about the, the land sale. Yeah. Uh, I think we're all sort of waiting. <laughs> it's been, uh, obviously the Yuga other side land was like the, the, crypto the the peak of the nft market coincided with the macro world collapsing and like the, the yeah there's insane expectations i think so it's going to be hard for them to meet them i i would say that so i participated in the first stress test they had two stress tests or load tests i think they called them over the last week or two where they just said hey we're uh, anyone who has an other side you know come in where we just want to test some stuff out try out our servers see how it goes and 
it was a better experience than I was expecting. I, d- I don't know what I was expecting, but there were like two and a half thousand people users when I was in there, like running around in this 3D environment. Um, it was really smooth. It felt like um, like running around like Call of Duty or maybe Fortnite, a game like that. Uh, it was so much more advanced than um, like a like a, a voxelated game engine that we've seen most of the metaverses be built on. So I think that was cool. And yeah, again, I have not like I don't really know what other side is going to bring, what the beta is going to look like. But yeah, and they have impossible expectations. But yeah, let's see. Like hopefully they execute well and and deliver something awesome. Your expectation for Saturday is that we'll find out a bit more about the game itself. Is, is I that think so right because that's my expectation okay yeah I and, and so. what you've seen thus far is really just like the the world and it looks great but we we really well, still don't know anything about if, how do you play what do you yeah. do it i would say the world feels great it was literally just like a white void with like a bunch of platforms you could jump on so you didn't actually see okay. any of the like the, the the world itself but um it felt Got clean it. and smooth and like it was the experience was was yeah it was nice all right good for them yeah that's uh we'll see we'll learn more as it uh, unfolds uh i want to talk about art blocks you mentioned it earlier obviously they're having a v- they're a very hot topic very hot drops you've got a dutch auction today again it's wednesday the 13th uh in three minutes so i know you've got a hard stop here in in like two minutes well no I'm, I could <laughs> so multitask. maybe this is a, maybe this is good timing here <laughs> okay yeah all right, fair enough. So, um, what is the what are the projects you're keeping your eye out for? Have you been, you know I know you've been purchasing. Are there any any projects that you were sort of watching once they got low enough that you were going to buy into, and then that seems to have uh, prompted this this craze we're in? Yes, a lot. Like I loathe to like name one or two because there's I've just been watching the whole market and there's there's been dozens of projects that I mean. Uplooks had a giga peak blow off top last August. It's like the NFT market had a, had a peak and blow off top. I'd say Uplooks was like an order of magnitude higher than that. And so it crashed an order of magnitude uh, harder than that when um, almost like in October, November, December last year, that first mini bear that we sort of went through before the real bear that we're in now, um, Uplooks crashed then and was like dead in the water for like three, four months in terms of like certain collections that you'd, you'd go look at the OpenSea activity and like there hadn't been a sale for two months. And that was like prime buying time, I think, and opportunities to to pick up collections that you really wanted. I was definitely buying through there. I was still minting several, like uh, I, I, basically every curated drop I would mint and then other ones I, I would keep an eye on. Um, and now, yeah, we're in this stage where there's a lot more attention on it. Um, it's very frothy, I would say, like generative art as a whole. More people are tweeting about it, myself included. Uh, Kevin Rose had a podcast uh, the round table that came out like a week ago talking about anti-cyclones and we saw a run on those squiggles had a whole bunch of activations like in new york they had a big thing there's a partnership with wag me united this football team um you know uh, eric snowfer he's flying around speaking in all sorts of places jeff davis the uh, i think coo or, or, or partner is flying around speaking and there's just a lot more attention on art blocks generative art you know other platforms fx hash is is really gaining traction and momentum as well um yeah it's it's an exciting time but it is it is a bit frothy so i loathe to like recommend or suggest people like mint yolo buy right now um definitely keep an eye on it like 100 percent. i think it's worth keeping an eye on looking at prices seeing where they go and um all that kind of stuff but this this auction literally that started right now is going to be super telling because last september August, September, when we had, they had implemented Dutch auctions, you would see people would like mint at the, the max price and the secondary would run off afterwards, but then it would come crashing down because so many people were just there speculating and trying to flip. And I can see right now there's 25 transactions pending. So it might mint out at the top price of three ETH. Um, and I think that it's, it's probably not going to sustain that price. So I'm uh, probably not going to mint, even though I really like it. Maybe I'll get one. <laughs> Yeah. A sigh of disappointment. Yeah, I was hoping it would go lower, but well, I'll pick it up on secondary a little lower. Exactly. It sounds like at some point. Exactly. Snowfro, I interviewed an hour ago, two hours ago, so that'll be coming out next week. Um, and you know, he he talked about the froth as well, and like you know, really just like I don't like it. You know, I like it when new people can can come in, and everything is cyclical though, right? So of course it it happens the way it does, which is that 
it gets really frothy, it gets really big, that gets attention onto generative art, which is a fantastic thing. And then it crashes and then that that paves way for new holders to come in. Yeah. And, and um, the people who maybe started to track it during the bull run can actually get in on, on reasonable prices. I know you've been tweeting, you said um, like equilibrium has been restored or, or something like that when uh, when the Fidenza floor once again went over 100 yeah. ETH and we had a Fidenza sell for half a million dollars yesterday, two days mm-hmm. ago. So um, the uh, the OGs and the the, the are, are doing quite well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's for those that believe and had conviction long term, I don't think it's necessarily surprising that we've bounced back. It is a little surprising that we're yeah, Outblocks is like pumping while we're in a bear market and, and things are going going sort of pretty terribly everywhere else. But um, yeah, uh, my long-term conviction has never wavered in terms of Outblocks, generative art as a movement. Um, I think we're still in the very, very early stages. We're going to see a lot more eyeballs and attention placed on, on gen art. Um, but at a time like this is when People who are attracted just because of the the money and 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 are trying to flip and it gets short term profit. Um, like case in point, this auction was it's basically minted out already um, at the top price three ETH. Um, I heard a really interesting stat yesterday. In the history of art blocks, there's only been there, there've been a bunch of mints that have minted out higher than two ETH. There's only one that has a floor higher than two ETH right now. So I think that alone is making me go, I'm not going to mint this at, at three or 2.7. Maybe I'm eating my words in a week or two and the floor is eight ETH or something. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to buy off the bodders when they undercut each other on secondary. Let me see if I have that stat right. Are you saying that of the projects that minted out over two ETH, only one of them still has a floor over two ETH? I believe so. I think fragments of an infinite field is the only one that falls in that category. Uh, the Eternal Pump is like a slight exception to that, that minted out. is only a collection size of 50 and, and there was ages beforehand. So I don't think that counts. Um, I'm not 100% sure that that's accurate, but I'm like 95%, 97% sure. Um, Do you think there are any bargains right now on our blocks? Uh, any bargains? I would say squiggles. I mean, I think that you can never go too wrong. Well, I, I wouldn't necessarily call it a bargain, but I would say it's a pretty decent buy. It's, it's a good bet on our blocks. And in USD terms, it's pretty close to like, the yearly lows um, in ETH terms, it's not. It went to like five, six ETH. Um, the, yeah, I, I would say there are some collections that are less, there are less eyes on it than others, but uh, the bargain time was two months ago, three months ago. Um, now we're in the sort of more eyeballs and adoption. Who knows? Like, I reckon, I mean, I, I again, with my level of conviction, I think many projects will be bargains now if you consider it from like a three year, five year, 10 year time horizon, you know, maybe like 70% of all of their curated collections, you know, whatever it is, maybe 90, maybe all of them. Um, but in like, if you, if you look at where we are now and, and are looking at it in a month, maybe we're at like a little local top, maybe we go for another one to two months and then crash again as it's very cyclical, but, um, yeah, I would say long-term time horizon, everything's a, bar- <laughs> everything's a bargain, but, in, in terms of local and where we are locally, it's um, it's been frothy and, and just be careful. Yeah. I want to ask you about a topic that I ranted a, a, quite a bit about on my last recap episode, which was a solo. I always miss you when I do hmm. solos, Zeneca. It's, it's a very odd experience talking to a microphone alone, which is the ENS domain craze. I mean, mm. I think uh, uh, as we talk about projects that seem to be doing well during this time, ENS domains have been one of the ones that have popped. And specifically, these like three and four digit ENS domains. We had porno.eth sell for like $200,000. Wow. So um, I don't know if you have an, an opinion on this or if you've been doing any buying in this space, but would love to get your take. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't really know about like the whole numbering thing. Um, I'm not fully versed in. I understand like the appeal of like three digit ENS names, um, just like people have uh, license plates, like number eight on a license plate. That's worth hundreds of thousands of dollars and stuff like that. Um, so I, I can understand that. And I think that there's there's value. I think as it, it, again, it got really frothy and people started extrapolating four digit, five digit, and then other languages and all that kind of stuff. And I think that that's when things got a bit crazy and, and unrealistic. Um, but fundamentally, like uh, I would say the core of some of those numbers and then some of those names, I think that there's value in it. Similar to how we look at domain names, you know, um, 
whatever, sex.com surely is going to be worth a ton of money, um, nike.com. So like today we saw a bunch of brands sell. I think starbucks.com sold for like 50 or 60 ETH, Nike for a similar amount, um, a few like that. Um, and just you think in the future when a brand comes in, it makes sense for them to want to have their ENS domain name um, and they're willing to pay up for it now or in the future. Um, I have friends who sort of bought a bunch of domain names you know, six months ago, eight months ago, um, I think all like the most popular ones had been taken, obviously Nike, Starbucks, but then they looked for like niches and like, well, stuff like that. And there's, there's probably still value out there. Yeah. 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 I mean, that was more or less my take. I won't bore people with it again. Cause I, I actually did rant about this for quite a while. Cause I'm, I'm quite skeptical on this number craze. Like I get it. I understand that li- license plates with short numbers are, are cool, but I think it's a, just such a speculative risky play as compared to the point you just made, which is the brand names. Mm. And to me, it's like, if you're going to spend $200,000, which I guess porno.eth, you could argue is more on the brand side, Mm. but somebody bought 000.eth, I think for like 300 ETH or something, right? Like if you're going to spend that kind of money, buy a brand that (laughs) is going to clearly need it. Like I made the point that I don't think, you know, I I sent an email to 000 at gmail.com and I got like a bounce back and nobody cares or has noticed that that's not an email address or that that's not an active handle on Twitter. And I I just, but for sure, you know, yeah, exactly. Starbucks and and Nike are going to notice if they don't have nike.com. So, um, anyway, okay. I want to get your reactions to some tweets Mm -hmm. that came out this week. Um, this one comes from, and we'll link to them, from Mike3 and Enjoy Your. He says, if you didn't get rich from NFTs already, you aren't going to. You're not early. You're very late to a mature collapsing Ponzi and regs are coming. You can still make money in the long-term rise of art, but you'll not be turning $500 into millions by flipping free 10K mints on plebes. What do you think? I think there's a reasonable amount of truth to that. Um, I would argue that like, well, I think we are very early still. Like, there's no two ways about that. If you look long-term time horizon, if NFTs, Web3, we're going to be around for decades, centuries, forever. You know, we're in the very, very early stages. Um, and I would also say that uh, it was never that easy to flip $500 into millions. Like, even last year, I know so many people, there have been so many people that were in the space, that were tracking it. I really appreciate you saying that as somebody who did not do that. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I mean, I got lucky. <laughs> I think so many of us got very lucky to, to be where we are. Um, and again, like it was never easy to do it and it's not easy to do it now. Like that part hasn't changed. Sure. It, I, I would say relatively it was easier. There might've been more opportunities, but like during a bull run, it's just easier to make money than in a bear run. But I, I don't think that means that there aren't tremendous opportunities still. And it's not extremely worthwhile spending your time to learn the technology, the space, network, um, find, uh, I think, without giving financial advice, I think that there are still amazing investment opportunities or things that you can buy that will be worth a lot more in the future. Um, But of course, it's high risk and it's not easy. It's just never been easy. Yep. I, I, I fully agree with this. I mean, I think this is a, like with what you just said and, you know, I think his take is a slightly like, uh, you know, it comes across a little aggressive and, and cynical and, and harsh. And, um, but I, I do think the sentiment of we might be at the end of, of flipping, like to, to your point, it was never easy to do it. But the fact that there were so many people who did manage to, I do think that's, we're probably at the end of that era of like, Here's just, here, here's a, I don't know, I can't think of a, a great example right now and, and probably don't want to like, you know, shit on anybody, but like here, here's something and then it's just going to kind of do this run up into hundreds of thousands of dollars. I, I, I don't know, I could talk myself both ways in it, which is why I wanted to get your opinion on this tweet rather than, than only posit my own. But I do think we're, we're probably entering a, the, the next phase of maturity in this market in a really positive way, but it does come at the cost of just like, you know, flipping your way to, to millionaire status, which to your point was never easy, but which we did see more than your average number of people do <laughs> mm-hmm. um, in, yeah. in the world as a result of NFTs. Yeah. Uh, Raul Powell, this is the next one I wanted to get your thoughts on, had an interesting thread where he, pulling it up, he said, observation on NFT communities. Why the stupid hoops to jump through for everything? 
It has become near impossible to stay on top of projects you were already involved with, allow lists, free mints, airdrops, mints, registrations, Dutch auctions, blah, 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 and all the things to just get to some next level of utopia, the promise of riches or breathlessly a game. This makes it super hard for anyone but DGENs. I'm all for gamification, but this is starting to look like a game for a game's sake with the ever promise, with ever the promise, much like the path to a Goldman Sachs partnership, endless carrot, lots of stick. He goes on, but I I won't... um, I won't. You get mm. the you get the gist there. What do you What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I think that, and, and I think that most people agree that we we went through that really, which is th- with this phase, which is thankfully over. It's like they're grinding for like a mintless spot, um, jumping through hoops, being in Discord, you know, drawing some fan art, um, all that kind of stuff. It was like quote unquote the thing to do for a while, and it worked, and it got engagement, and it got people talking about your project, so people did it, but people hated it and thankfully it's kind of over now um so like i i think projects need to rethink their approach and something that we're seeing more and more of that i've like been feeling and talking about for a while is that this idea of like well discord fatigue wallet fatigue project fatigue it's it's the more projects you you buy into and invest in you can't realistically track be part of like an active community member in more than like a handful at once i would say and even that like in five communities at once is, is a little tricky and difficult. And, and I'm, this is, I spend all my time in this space and, and like as someone who like, maybe you have a full-time job, you have a family, you have, you're studying, you have commitments. Um, it's really difficult to stay on top of stuff. And then it, it adds stress and anxiety. Cause you're like, well, am I going to miss out on a free airdrop or a claim or you know, a, a mint list spot? And then, and then you find out about it later on and you feel regret cause you missed money and all that kind of stuff. So um, totally agree. I think that projects should rethink, their approach should should simplify as much as possible. Um, that's like a grander thing that I'm thinking, seeing, and, and feeling more of. It's the idea of like keeping things simple and like as ecosystems get more complicated, Pixel Vault and, and the Punks Comics thing, I think is a great example. It's really convoluted and complicated. And I've like basically, I, I, I'm into it. I've been there from day one. I have no idea what the hell's going on. I don't track it or follow it anymore. And I'm missing out on value for sure in certain instances, but um and i'm not alone and i think that that just it almost sours me for the project a little bit and other projects like that um whereas if someone can do it relatively simply um i appreciate that and i think more and more people are becoming to appreciate that it's funny because what came to mind for me hearing this is like it, it feels like a game for game's sake which i agree with uh but it, I think it was born out of the one utility question. It was born out of having these communities that were constantly asking for more and wanting more. So on the one hand, we all hated the, the having to keep up with it all, but it was also, you know, us in the macro sense that, that drove this behavior. I don't think that founders wanted to have to be doing all of this yeah. either. You know, yeah, like, We've all been tired, but it was, um, in the, in the kind of crazy bull and, and, it, you know, it felt like it's what you had to do in order to, um, create value or, or be seen as a legitimate project or hell just to be seen as not a rug. I think in some ways it was like, if you're not talking or doing things, well, you're a rug then. And so, yeah. um, you know, th- I do think those are the things that we're keeping, or those are the things maybe to some extent, even still with some projects that are keeping values propped up. Um, and so I, this maybe ties back to where I think there might be more pain to come. Like, if, if we rethink all of this in, in the short term, I think there may be concern or like, like, you know, what, what is kind of keeping the, the value there for, for certain projects if you don't have um, some of this going on. Yeah. So uh, we're in a, as all bear markets are, you're in a, a reconfiguring stage and uh, I'm, I'm excited about where we'll be on the other side of this, but I think there might be some more blood on the streets, you know, over the next yeah. 12 months as we, as we reconfigure. Yeah. For certain projects, like absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's going to be a tricky several months, year ahead. Final tweet that I want to get your thoughts on. So this was from uh, Nansen, like the Nansen intern account. So Nansen being like the um, metrics, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, you can track all sorts of different information about NFTs uh, and tokens analytics and who, who are the whales that are buying. Yeah. Analytics, yeah, like yeah. it's an analytics platform. Um, and so this tweet says, why I'm confident that three of the four most profitable NFT trader wallets are owned by the same person or entity. And then they proceed to give a thread showing that they tend to have activity around the exact same time. They've all interacted with each other. They all came online. These three different wallets all came online at the same time. They tend to buy similar things. Um, compelling case, I won't, I, I'm not, you know, it's kind of visual. So we'll link to this tweet and then I'll, I'll ask, mm. you know, folks can go check it out if they're interested. 
So I've, I'm in like loosely persuaded that three of the top four most profitable NFT trader wallets are actually one person. And I guess my question mm-hmm. is, does this matter at all? Are there any implications to this? Are there any hot takes to have from this? Or it's just like, oh, wow, there's somebody out there who's even rich, richer than we realize. <laughs> um, I don't think it matters too much. Uh, I mean, I kind of already, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering who it is. Like there's a really profitable problem. Uh, prevalent prominent trader sneaky ninja pants is his like screen name and i wouldn't be surprised if, if this mm. is him i know he has two wallets that are like at least up there and have been extremely profitable so um it makes sense like a lot of uh, people have multiple wallets and i guess like the the cynical and nefarious angle could be if they use one wallet to slowly accumulate and the other wallet to do a massive sweep causing the price to go up and then they dump from the other wallet and then um, but in many instances, it's like all is fair in, in love and, and blockchains. So like it's, it's public and <laughs> decentralized and, you know, people can view it like, like this Nansen person has. And as lo- like in terms of ethical behavior, I think, I think it's fine as long as they're not like going on Twitter and shilling it and, and pumping the price up and then immediately dumping and doing that. Um, it's, it's just like, yeah, I'm, I'm not too turned off by it or anything or, or even necessarily that surprised by it yeah all right fair enough no hot take i didn't have one either but i found it striking and i wanted to see if uh again you can tweet at us if somebody else out there has a has a hot take on the implications of this all right Zen. well i think that is our show for this week we'll be back you'll be back in a couple of weeks i'll be back next week talking about more of the same and uh thanks as always for joining amazing thank you for having me this was this was wonderful and uh I, I did get an up blocks. <laughs> I sniped one on secondary um, while this was happening. Oh, what'd you get? What'd you pay for it? Uh, I so I paid a little high. It was uh, it might not age well. Four point six ETH, but it I think it's it's really beautiful and it's it's very rare. It's number twelve, running moon running moon number twelve. Wow. Yeah, but I'll, I'll running say this. Running moon is the yeah. What's the name of this this drop today? What was the name of yeah. it? Running moon by Lucia uh, L- He. Uh, oh, hey, I might be mis- probably mispronouncing that. Um, it is, it's really beautiful, but um, it's, it's very clear that the, the, the drop was botted. There's, a fi- it's, there's 500 in the collection, 207 are currently for sale. So within like 20 minutes, um, 40% is up for sale. So it is, to my mind, almost guaranteed to drop. Um, I, I just happened to see this one that I thought was beautiful at a Reason like even if the floor drops to one point five ETH, I, I think getting this for four and a half was still. I'm happy to pay that for it. Um, but yeah, bots and I, I think bots are going to get wrecked. Thankfully, it, it's fun. Like if you like spend time in the Outblocks Discord and community, most people sort of saw this coming, and there's like this, um, uh, like almost like screw the bots attitude. We're like, well, we're just not going to buy. Like we are the collectors, and most of us, if we just decide not to buy price will tank and we'll buy them when it drops to like when they keep undercutting each other and the floor gets to like two ETH, one ETH, whatever. Um, but I, I do think it's a really beautiful collection and over time um, it will bounce back and perform well. Um, one, one last note and then we wrap up. It, it's, it's, it didn't help the collection that it has moon in the title of it. <laughs> Running moon, that's just like rife for yeah. <laughs> and mean lords. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go check it out right now. I'm excited. I will, I, I will close on this. I know I always people never want to hear about things outside of NFTs on, on podcasts. And I know that, but I want to shout out, I'm in Maryland right now. So if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm at my uh, aunt and uncle's house. I call them aunt and uncle. And uh, my uncle made this door. And as we're talking about art and pretty aesthetic things, it's a very cool door. So if you're watching on YouTube, check it out. Cool Amazing. backdrop this, this week. And um, all right, I will catch you next time. <laughs>so much for watching this episode of Overpriced JPEGs. If you liked this conversation, if you liked this episode, please go ahead and hit subscribe. It helps me out. It helps the show out. And it means you will get alerts and updates when we post new content. Thanks again.